I wish, hey, that's what I'm talking about. I wish I could say that I was in seminaries working on my masters, or I wish I could tell you guys that I was on a foreign missions trip doing something amazing. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to tell you guys that I spent 12 years in prison. You would have never guessed that when you looked at me, right? You're like, that dude is a doctor. <laughs> He's a scientist. I spent 12 years in some of uh, America's most dangerous, most violent prisons that America has to offer. I was at USP uh, Leavenworth in Kansas, USP Lompoc um, Penitentiary, Halava State Penitentiary. Sadly enough to say is that the only time I've been to Southern California is when I was being shipped with handcuffs on a bus. I've been to Linwood County Jail, Kern County, San Bernardino County, Twin Towers. That was my tour of your beautiful uh, LA area. So I always didn't get the best picture. But before I go in and tell you about uh, my prison experience, I'd like to share with you a little bit of what kind of led up to that door. I was raised in a house that was full of violence. From the very early age, I had all the ingredients to make the perfect recipe of disaster. My father was stabbed to death 28 times, the last one hitting him in his heart where he died in my front yard in the arms of my grandfather. My grandfather, a short period of time later, was also murdered in the streets of San Francisco, also stabbed to death. My mother grew up in the foster care system. She was broken. She was hurt. And her life was out of control. And she made decisions that were detrimental to me and to my sister. And I'll tell you what I felt like as I grew up. I felt like carry-on luggage. I can't remember a time when I was happy as a child. I was always in a constant state of fear. For each man that came into my house, he brought in more pain, more hurt, more anger, and I felt the blunt force of all this, these guys, as each one came in. At 14 years old, I had so much on my plate, but I'm gonna tell you what it was like at 14. I just wanted to die. When everybody was worrying about what they were gonna to wear to school, when everyone was worrying about um, their homework and things of that nature, man, there was so much more on my plate. And it was about that time that I had my first drink of alcohol. And at that moment, when I took that into my body, when I consumed it, I mean, it was like I was waiting for this my whole life. Because it started to numb of some of those things that were going on inside of me. And if my life wasn't um, already extremely messed up, at that exact same time, my mother tells me that she has AIDS. Now, all we knew at that time is that you die. And I kept thinking to myself when she told me, I mean, I never cried out uh, to any God. I wasn't raised in a religious home at all. I was raised in the dope house. I was raised with drug addicts, prostitutes, heroin. I was beat every single day almost. Grown men putting their hands on me, punching me, blood leaking from my nose at 10 years old. My body covered with bruises all the way down my back. But I knew at this point when my mother told me, I had to cry out to somebody. I remember like it was yesterday. She had AIDS. She did die. 
and what that was like. Take that pit bull that's been chained up in the backyard. People have come by. They have thrown rocks at it. He has not eaten in days. When my mother died, it was like that pit bull was let off its leash. Now just picture this. If the people that are supposed to be nourishing me, nurturing me, loving me, protecting me, if they're the ones that are hurting me, if they are the ones that are destroying me every day, what do you think my thoughts are of the people outside of this house? Y'all trying to kill me. And so I use this anger and I funnel it into this mean gasoline mixture. And I used it as justification to what I did on the streets. My friends thought I was crazy because I was willing to do stuff that most people even in the hood aren't willing to do. I ran these streets doing everything I could do. And I'm going to put up this first picture and show you guys. Did you see that one? I'm about 22 years old, sitting with over $100,000. I didn't get that doing stocks. <laughs> All right. Well, one plus one is always two. And any way you cut it, there's only two things that's going to happen when you're in this lifestyle. One, You will be murdered, just like your grandfather, just like your father. And so I knew I was going to die. So at 23 years old, I went and took a little bit of that cash, and I went and bought everything that I would need for my burial. The casket, the plot, everything. Everything is going to say, I bought it in cash. $5 bills, $12,000. But... Somebody up there had other plans for me. I didn't die. I didn't get killed. I went to prison at 24 years old. A very young 24 years old. And I wish that even at this time that I could tell you that I learned something here. But the truth of the matter is, all I did was consume alcohol, take psych meds, and a number of other different narcotics that we were able to get in prison, and I did more push-ups, and I plotted, and I just meditated on what I was going to do to this community upon my release. And that's all I did for five and a half years was plot. There's even a, a place in prison that other inmates will not go, and that is violence towards the police, violence towards COs. You see, that's a lose-lose situation every single time. And every single time I chose to lose. I spent a year in the shoe. That is a prison with inside a prison. That's where they say, look, you're so off the hook that you can't even be with other inmates. And they would slide my food in through this little slot just like you see on TV. And I spent a year in that. And all I kept doing was more and more push-ups. And it was like this. You ever seen those like uh, National Geographics with that lion? Like he was um, trapped inside this cage. All he kept doing was going back and forth, back and forth. I was that lion going back and forth. They did release me. Could you imagine that? They released me back to the community. I am telling you guys what I was thinking about and plotting on upon my release. I was going to get everything back that they took. Everything. And I didn't last (laughs) 20 minutes on these streets. I was already into my addiction just feeding my flesh as much as I could. I was out less than a year and a half. But something changed. 
I met a woman. Isn't that always the case? Kingdoms have risen and fall. And she was different. She came from a different world than I came from. And I didn't know what love was. And I didn't know what it was like to be a husband or a father. Everything that was modeled to me was based off of destruction. I was still deeply um, entangled in my addiction. I got married to this young lady. We had a beautiful little girl. And I did on the surface what everyone else did, like got the little house, got the little fence right there, got the pit bull. Everybody got pit bulls, right? (laughs) And I fell in love with this little girl. I call her my miracle baby because that's one of the first things that started to really break into this calloused heart. This baby girl was falling asleep on my chest and I fell in love with her. But my actions had brought me right back to prison and my wife was nine months pregnant with our first son. My daughter was one years old and I was sitting in this prison cell broken just broken how did I get here again and this guy came up to me and I thought it was crazy and this is why I thought he was crazy because he's in prison he's doing I think almost 13 years and he looked happy like (laughs) what is that see he had something that I didn't understand at the time he had peace And peace was very foreign to me. But he kept coming back to my cell, and every single time I told him, man, get out of here, dude, and I didn't say it that nice either. (laughs) Get out of here, please. No, I didn't say that. But he had something in his hand, and he brought it to me. And I got off the phone with my wife, and I can only describe it like this. My whole chest was completely ripped out of me. This thing was hollow when I was sitting on this floor. And for a kid that stopped crying when he was not even a teenager, tears were falling down my face. What's going to happen to my wife? What's going to happen to these kids? I know what the streets has for them because they already gave it to me. Who's going to protect them? He came in my cell and he handed me a Bible. That was nine years ago. I never put it down since. This time, I got seven and a half years, and I was looking down this hallway, and I ended up doing six years straight on that bid. Man, my wife was out there, this hectic world, baby, two babies, and I did everything I could to change who I was. I went back to school. I went, got my GED, went to college, went to seminary while I was in prison. I took every class that I could take. I consumed books after books after books. And 10 years I was in prison, and I wasn't just one of these guys who got in line. You see, I was what they call a shot caller. I was a guy that made decisions on other people's life. I decided who got to stay on this yard and who didn't get to stay on this yard. I ran my car. And in prison, you have this micro universe, a universe and a universe. We have our own money. We got our own currencies. We got our own different things of food. Guards, everything are on the payroll. And if you guys know anything about prison, what happens is the larger numbers win. The crazier you are, you're okay. But this time I was changed. And I was trying to use that uh, position that I had as a voice of reason. But the only thing that was happening is I was serving two masters while I was in prison. I had my foot over here trying to do these things, and then I would run back and try to do all the right stuff. I was contaminating everything I was trying to do over here. So with 10 years in, I decided I was going to get out of the gang. And so what that's like is you are, you become a, you're coming from being a killer whale in prison to 
a little minnow. Best thing I ever did, though. Scariest thing I ever did, but the best thing I ever did. I was released from prison, and I went back to the place where most of all my trouble was, what's called the Tenderloins, in San Francisco, California. It is the lost of the lost, the broken of the broken, drug addiction, prostitution, everything. (laughs) The devil's playground. My wife lived two hours away from me. Now look at me. Who's hiring me? I have no resume. I was trying to cover up these tattoos on my face with makeup. I barely knew how to use a cell phone. Everything had changed so much in the course of six years. And every single job I went to, I was getting denied, getting denied, getting denied. And I started to feel lost again. I started to feel those feelings that I had when I was a boy. And I bumped into somebody as I was in the streets, a pastor, and very quickly a relationship developed. And he said, man, you are my brother. You have nowhere to live. You have no place to go. Move in with me. And so when I moved in with him, it wasn't that we were opening the Bible and going over scriptures every day. Man, this man was modeling out what it looked like to be a father. He was modeling out what it looked to be a husband, a friend. First, just opening his home and showing me hospitality. He moved from the master bedroom to a little bedroom that his son lived in. Who's doing that? Who's bringing guys like me? Hello, honey. Look what I brought home. (laughs) He comes with an ankle monitor. Me, my wife, my children, we, uh, we all got to live there, and we got to live out this thing. And what you see now is the product of one man that took the time to invest into another man. Today, let me tell you what I'm not. I am not that lost, broken little child anymore. I know my value. I know my worth. And I'll tell you what I am today. I am a husband. I am a father. My kids are being nurtured. I am a pastor. I have opened up three churches this year. And now my sole job is going back into these hoods. Amen, amen. It is dedicated to going back into these places and being the hands and feet that I wish that I had as I was a child. I go back into these places. Where I work at is Hunters Point, San Francisco, where you are six times more likely to be killed than anywhere else in San Francisco. I run a house, a discipleship house called Project Bayview. I've had the privilege to travel around the world speaking. This is me in Ethiopia. How long would you say it would take for a guy to come from prison to director, to pastor, to husband, to friend? Like how many years would this take? And by the way, I went back to school when I got out. I went to culinary school, graduated a chef, was a a kitchen chef for a long period of time. How long does this take from the gate of prison to where I'm at currently, sharing a stage with these men, intellectual, smart, motivated? Man, it's a privilege to be up here. Three years. What am I doing with Condoleezza Rice? Like, does this even like... She thanked me for the message I gave at her church. She came up to meet me.
What is ridiculous is a life that was full of hate has turned into a life of love. What is ridiculous is a life that came for revenge to a life of forgiveness. A life that was filled with death is now filled with life. That is ridiculous. Thank you.